Okay, so coming back to the question of intentional signaling, we talked a little bit about this yesterday also, and I think what is really important is that we have to distinguish when we talk about intentional signaling between the intention to alter the behavior of others, which is a key point in communicating. Yeah? So if you signal as an animal, it's mainly about altering the behavior of others. But what we are thinking about when we're talking about intention is, in language is that we want to not only alter the behavior of others, but we also have the intention to alter the knowledge state of the others. And that means, of course, that you have to have an idea that someone else has a knowledge state that's different from yours. So this is the theory of mind problem, yeah? that you have to have some understanding that the knowledge state of another animal or another person can be different from yours, and you're trying to manipulate that knowledge state. So you're, in, in a sense, you're intending to provide information. Yeah? Uh, no matter whether this is to your own benefit or to the mutual benefit. And then it came up with this scheme. There are many other people, like Tom Scott Phillips, just published a book on um, intentional communication. And it's basically relatively similar. He talks about ostensive in inferential communication, but, but I still find uh, Dennett's scheme relatively helpful to sort of sort through you know, the different cases. So we can have simple expressions of emotions. For instance, I can make a disgust face when nobody's in the room, um, when I've eaten something awful or, I, or my hand touched something you know, slimy or something, I can make a disgust face and it doesn't have any um, first order or second order intentionality is just an expression of my emotional state in this moment, so that would be zero order. Or I can try to get you to do something for me, that would be first order, or I'm trying to share knowledge, this is what I'm doing now, is um, you know, to try to alter your knowledge states. And the big question is not whether there is intentional communication in animals, because communication much of communication is inherently intentional in the sense that it has been selected for to alter the behavior of others. But the crucial questions when we talk about language is whether we find any evidence that their animals are trying to alter the knowledge state of others. And that's now many people who have sort of given up on referential communication and these kinds of similarities are now focusing on intentional communication. And that's different from what we discussed yesterday, uh, where we talked about understanding intention. That's a different ballgame again. Yeah? So we hear the first, we're, I'm now focusing on intentional signaling, not the understanding of intentions. Okay? And um, there are two studies out there, relatively similar, on the same subject by different research groups. They come to relatively similar conclusions. And what these people did, so the first study was published by Kathy Crockford and Roman Wittig and Klaus Tuberbühler. Um, they have these chimpanzees in Budongo. And uh, chimpanzees travel in parties. And you have, maybe sometimes you're lucky, you have one animal that's sort of traveling ahead of the other chimps. And then you provide it with some information. So here there's a snake here, yeah, a gaboon viper, a model. And then you hope the chimp will detect the viper, and then you observe the response, specifically when other animals are entering the scene and they haven't seen the snake yet. Yeah? So that's the crucial distinguishing feature is you have some other animals that may come with you, and they have already seen the snake, and there are other animals that are ignorant of the snake, or they have heard you calling before, and do you adjust your signaling behavior in relation to the putative knowledge state of the other animals on the scene. So that's the question. I hope the video works. <coughs> okay, that's so. You hear these very soft things? So these are alert ones. You see the snake and the little one.
Okay. What have you seen? What's going on? Yeah. Okay, so there's some good indication that the animal has actually detected something it didn't like, yeah. That it found, you know, freakish. Okay, and then? But there's no signaling. Yeah. No signaling. Unless the, what is it? No, this whoop, 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 whoop. That's yeah, a signal. Oh, there was a yeah, I thought it was a bird. I thought it was a bird. No, no, no. There is this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the chimp. It's very soft. Uh, and just like a little chimp. No, he doesn't come closer. He doesn't come closer? No, he was looking back. Yeah, he's, he's checking. Okay. Yeah. It seems like he's not wasting his energy as long as he knows that his. Uh, Warning signals are going to be heard by anyone else from the group. So that's what I thought that maybe the because I thought that the uh, background sound was not his, but it was his, and maybe he was making some uh, warning signal, but maybe at a lower wasting that energy. Yeah. Okay. But he's also not leaving the scene and kind of waiting, so signaling and um, waiting for the others also to realize and. Just yeah, like being more cautious. Also, um, seems like considering the rest of the group, mm -hmm. and not just sneaking away from the snake. Okay, so you think he may be sitting there to to so indicate to the others. You might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think he's more checking for himself. Is it is it is it just the model or is it a snake? is it a real snake? Like waiting, does it move or does it not move? So I don't think that he was aware, I mean, he was once checking, but he's not really aware of the group coming. Is the snake planted by the researchers? Yeah, 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 <laughs> sure. That's the case, that's the point, I mean, yeah. And we don't really know when the other one entered the scene, given the camera movement, which is really at the end, so we don't really know what the background is. Yeah. So it's a question of if a group, a troop, encountered a snake, would they all stop? Yeah. What I'm trying to convey here is that it's really difficult to make a good case of what's going on. You know, this is open to many different kinds of interpretations. You could make the interpretation, he's sitting there because he wants, you know, to warn the other, so he's waiting, you know, he's making a point. And then he's looking, and then there's one who that's a bit, little bit louder, he's making because, you know, when the others are visible, or soon after they're visible in the camera. But you could also say, okay, maybe he's just excited that they're there, and therefore he makes a who that's a little bit louder. And that's the huge problem that we have with these kinds of experiments. You have very little control. We don't see when the other animals are actually coming. We don't know who's coming. We don't know what they've grasped before, how good their hearing is. Have they heard soft hoos before they entered the scene? And that's what makes these experiments very difficult to uh, interpret and make a good case, except you send it to current biology and then you can make a strong case, of course, because that you've shown for the very first time that there's intentional communication. And these are my friends, I love them dearly. But it's a very strong interpretation, yeah? And it's one of the huge problems because, you know, I don't want to rule out that they're intending to communicate, but I wouldn't place a big bet on that they do based on this kind of evidence. So therefore, it's kind of tempting to infer that, that they're intending to communicate, but, you know, you can have a fierce attacker and he will completely derail you. You know, you can make a very good case that there's no evidence for intentional communication in the sense, second order intentional communication. Yeah, Dina. I'm wondering what the typical reaction would be if it had been a real live snake. I mean, if it had been me, I'd been out of there. You know, I, would have, I, I wouldn't have hung around sort of looking at the snake to see if it was moving. I, I would have gotten out of that situation. And then, you know, while warning my colleagues. What, is this a typical reaction to sort of yeah. hover there and Observe the snake? Or yeah. Look sort of yeah, yeah. Undecided about what to do? Or? Yeah, yeah. No, snakes don't 
typically come after you. And so basically the best strategy is often is actually they recruit others and they try to mob the snake. They start calling and then the snake moves away. Yeah. Yeah. And also there is this misconception, I think, by many people, so alarm calling is like, why would you alarm call? Then the predator detects you. I mean, the predators know exactly where you are, even if you're silent. On the contrary, there is selection for letting the predator know that you've detected him. So in many animals, including antelope, you can see antelope, when they see a leopard, they all go to the leopard. They all stand, you know, as a crowd in front of the leopard and have these, these snorts, these alarm snorts, and that means we know where you are and you will not get us. It's also a quality signal, so alarm calling is much more complex than simply alerting, you know, there's, a, there's a, something dangerous and I have to get out of here. It's, it's much more intricate. So would a snake actually attack an, an animal that large? I guess they have big snakes. There. Yeah, some would. Uh, at least bite, you know, in defense perhaps. So if you would now start maybe, you know, approaching the snake and touching it, then the snake might bite, yeah. So that, that's not what they're doing. They're always keeping a safe distance. Yeah. But would alarm calling not attract uh, attention to yourself um, and therefore be interactive? Yeah, but, but if it depends on the, it, like aerial alarms, it's often confined. So they make one call and then that's it, then they're silent. But predator alarms, you're better off if you tell the predator, I do see you, you will not get me. So it's actually a signal of quality, you know? Yeah? So um, what kind of snakes are they? So are it, um, would this snake, when the egg um, is covered the snake, would the snake still be able to get the monkey, or is it too slow so it would get another bull or something like that? I don't know. It. Yeah. But it's enough to know that, okay, there's a snake, I have to be careful, and as soon as I, I see the snake, it's not that big danger anymore because I know where it is, and I can have kind of I know of no case of, you know, a viper attacking a chimp, but, you know, it's very difficult to see. I mean, we've had one baboon falling out of a tree dead, and we thought that must have been a snake. I mean, it was a healthy baboon, you know, he climbed up, and then, you know, an hour later he just dropped dead, <laughs> so we don't know what happened. But um, I would say these animals, I mean, the vervets, they get eaten, yeah, but baboons or chimps, they don't get eaten by snakes, you know. Not at all. So, but it's certainly something they are like us, you know. I mean, we had one of those model snakes that we used to evoke alarm calls in our hut, and I knew it was a stuffed snake. And every time I startled when I entered the hut, you know, finally I had to cover it with something because I was kind of <laughs> going like this all the time. Okay, this is about intentional signaling. So, this is, I mean, there are more people focusing and trying to understand whether there is second order intentionality in the signaling behavior of non-human primates and it's very, very, very difficult. And there have been other experiments under more controlled conditions with, for instance, um, macaques by Robert and Dorothy uh, at Davis where they exposed the infant to a predator, a vet in this case, Mark Hauser disguised as a vet when he was still a PhD student, and the mother could see that there was this danger approaching, but the infant couldn't. And now, of course, you would predict that the mother would inform the infant. She didn't, yeah. So she was not able to do this perspective taking. And then the chimp people, the chimpologists say, no, but that's, you know, that's monkeys, okay? Monkeys, they're too daft. They have no indication of any theory of mind. Chimps are different. There is more attribution of knowledge states, so chimps is different. And there's one experiment by Sarah Boysen, or Sally Boysen, well, it's her nickname. She replicated, or she used the same design as Robert and Dorothy, so one chimp was exposed to a vet and couldn't see it, and the other chimp could see it and warn that chimp. And there was some indication that one, the chimp who could see the vet was started to scream and alarm bark, but only if it was a friend. So, you know, but we need more of these kinds of experiments that try to have a better control over the situation and, perf and still look at what's going on in the wild to try to understand what's, you know, whether we do have some evidence, good evidence, you know, but I think the jury is still out there. But I wouldn't place my bet, you know, based on this kind of data that we have here. Yeah. And can you just clarify how, how in this kind of biology paper they, they would, is this an anecdotal stuff or presumably they found some way to statistically have 
Yeah, I mean, so um, I think it was a 111 snake encounters altogether. And the problem was they had um, three knowledge states of the recipient. The others had seen and heard, uh, seen the snake and heard the alarm calls. They had only heard the alarm calls before they came and they had neither heard the alarm calls or seen the snake. And the neither was only five cases. So that's the really interesting test case. And in three of these five cases, the animal resumed calling. In the others, you cannot rule out a um, audience effect. So basically, the signaler adjusts its own signaling behavior because the others are behaving differentially according to their own knowledge state. So that's another thing you have to rule out. And this with wild animals that are roaming in a forest, you know, that's not easy. I mean, it's very difficult to get, you know, a good clean data set. So I, I think it's good to attempt, uh, to try it, uh, to make these attempts, but you also have to be aware of, you know, how inconclusive in the end the data can be. Okay, now we're coming to part two. <laughs> um, so we've learned in the first part, I hope you all agree, that uh, there is very limited evidence for vocal learning. These patterns appear to be rather fixed. And the question is, why is that so? You know, what can the studies of maybe the genetic foundations of vocal production tell us? Um, and then I will move on and go to the other side of the communicative diet and talk about the listener's perspective and present a study with what I call primate pragmatics and we are, I already alluded to it, do these monkeys take contextual information into account when they you know, respond to calls? And then some final remarks on evolutionary reconstruction. Okay, so I'm not going to expand this because Simon is going to talk about it for sure. Um, uh, the famous FOXP2 gene and its very intriguing molecular evolution. And this was the study by, led by Wolfgang Inhardt and then Svante Pebo and many, many collaborators where they uh, reconstructed um, the phylogeny and then there is this intriguing uh, substitution of two of the amino acids after the split between humans and chimps. And when I was at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig at that time, Svante said, okay, we want to do a study where we basically construct this version in a chimp. And then, of course, we can't. For ethical reasons, that's not possible, but we can try to implement this humanized version in a mouse and then see how it affects the vocal behavior of mice. And that was particularly intriguing because at that point, a study by Holy and Guo had been published on song, mouse songs, and people, although there was you know, some indication in literature from on the 50s on, that mice have these elaborate ultrasonic vocalizations. Thank God we you know, can't hear them because otherwise every farmer would you know, freak out because it's so, you know, they're very <laughs> verbose, or they can be very verbose. Anyway, so they asked me if I would like to contribute to the study of um, the effects of the humanized version of the FOXP2 gene in the mouse. How is, how it, I mean, there was a huge consortium and I, uh, with Kurt Hammerschmidt from my lab, we looked at the effects in the, on the vocalizations. And in the first paper, in the big cell paper with about 180 um, collaborators, um, we looked at the pup vocalization. So when the mouse pups are a few days old, and you take them away from the mother and you put them in a cold beaker, they start to make these whistles, these high-pitched whistles. So they're, the frequency is about yeah, 80 kilohertz, um, and then you can measure different features. And we found consistent acoustic differences in the uh, vocalizations of the control um, animals compared to the ones that were homozygous for the humanized version of the FOXP2 gene. So we found consistent differences that the calls weren't as high pitched and there were also some difference in the slope. We had no idea whether that was biologically significant, whether it was due to some developmental changes, but we did find these um, differences in a relatively large batch of, of 68 animals. Um, what we didn't know at that time was uh, how the adult male songs 
differed. And this is the uh, study that we just uh, published last year, where we looked at the songs of the adult males they make in the mating encounters when they're encountering females or urine of females. And here we found no differences whatsoever. So uh, if you look at the wild type, then the ones homozygous uh, with the humanized version and then the heterozygous animals, neither in the number of elements or the start frequency or the maximum location of the peak or the element duration or, or, or <laughs> No matter what we looked at, we found no difference whatsoever. And this suggests that the effects that we found in the pups reflect some differences in the developmental trajectory. But in the end, they produce exactly the same cause. OK, we are the lab for negative evidence. Um, but a more interesting question is, are mice actually good models to study vocal learning? Are mice vocal learners? And uh, Petkov and Jarvis said yes, and they also said it's important to distinguish between different forms of vocal learning. There is not black and white, so either you are a vocal learner or you're not a vocal learner, but there is actually continuous distribution. You can be either uh, like in humans, you know, high vocal learners, uh, high capacity for vocal learning, uh, parrots also high vocal learners, and they have this sort of this step function here. And the number of species plotted against the complexity of vocal learning, so most animals are non-vocal learners, and then you have fewer and fewer species where you have high-end um, high vocal learning. And they place the mouse here, they, claiming that they are moderate vocal learners. So, who has read the papers that I put in the folder? Can you summarize sort of the key finding of the Aryaga? Can you sort of remember what was? Um, is that the plot one? <laughs> paper? Um, yes. Um, yeah, from what I understood, basically, even if you manipulate uh, the Fox P2, you don't find differences in the vocalizations. Uh, I think I need to kind of recall it. Yeah, then, okay. Is it the Jarvis paper? Yeah. yeah. Of mice. yeah. Um, that the mouse ultrasonic vocalization is shaped so that there is some shaping going on. But I forgot how they showed it. Just um, <coughs> It's not 100% vocal learning that they got a new um, sound, but um, it, it can be shaped during mm -hmm. the uh, Depending on the context or environment. Thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they show this act activation in the cortex when they are vocalizing and the projection from the cortex to the um, the nuclear in the brain stem to sort of regulate the ambiguous nuclear or something like that. Um, and then they go on to show that this is important for the learning that Adriana just said. Yeah. And they also show that direct projection to improve the context. This is what is yeah. only known for humans. Yeah. But then if you have no cortex at all, if you have no pattern, which is the second paper. OK, so that's the, the other paper. What was in the other paper? If you remove the whole pallium, then they still vocalize as normal. And there's no evidence of uh, any kind of learning through the whole So without the cortex, you can vocalize just the same. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to walk the rest of you who don't have such an excellent memory or maybe have had time to look at the paper. So here is the evidence for vocal learning. So this is basically the summary of the, the papers that show that there are some effects, experiential effects, on vocal output. So here we have um, one piece of evidence was call convergence in different mouse strains. I think that was the evidence you were referring to, that if you put together two different, this is almost like with the chimps, you know, here. So we have... Um, one uh, strain and then the other, when you pair them together, they become more and more similar to each other. So this suggested to the authors that auditory input, you know, can affect your um, call convergence. But again, strikingly, only in one of the two strains, not in the other. So one stayed fixed, the other changed features, and we don't know why. Okay. Then they also found um, that animals that were deafened produced noisier calls. Um, suggesting that auditory feedback plays some role in 
um, vocal production. Again, something that people have taken as evidence for um, preconditions for vocal learning. And the third piece was the projections from motor cortex lar lar laryngeal motor neuron pools. Again, saying, okay, this was only found in um, humans before, and this may suggest that they have some, you know, top-down control over mo uh, output. Um, there were some people who were more skeptical, um, and including us. And so we heard there's this group um, up at the Max Planck Institute for um, Biophysical Chemistry, um, and they had this mouse model, they were developmental biologists, or they are developmental biologists, they had this mouse model uh, that um, lacks large parts of the cortex and the hippocampus. So basically, this is a coronal section here, you see, you know, this is all missing here. And the hippocampus is, yeah, is missing, and we thought, okay, this is a really interesting model to look at the importance of the cortex for vocal output. So how much, you know, um, auditory processing, you know, may affect your vocal output. And if you can't do this anymore in, at the cortical level, um, what happens to, to your vocal output? And we found nothing. I mean, there was no effect. There was no changes in the vocal behavior at all. And it was altogether really striking how, um, viable these animals were, and they bred successfully, they raised their offspring successfully, um, they were a little bit weaker, they were able to do some simple learning tasks, but no unlearning, so they were limited, so some limited flexibility, but altogether it was actually quite striking how well they did, although they had no cortex and no hippocampus, <laughs> at least in the lab environment. I think outside they wouldn't, you know, survive, but <laughs> in the lab environment they do quite well. Uh, further negative evidence is that there is no effect of cross-fostering. So other, in other strains, in other groups, they couldn't uh, um, replicate the effect of you know, putting two strains together and finding call convergence in any way or being raised by another uh, strain, like if you're a pup, you're an exchanger, raised by um, a mother that has sounds with different um, call characteristics, you do not take on these call characteristics, you keep your own call characteristics, and no effect of deafening in other studies. So we concluded that mice, we think, are not obligatory learners. They don't require auditory input to develop their own songs. It does not exclude top-down control. So that, you know, single very weak projection from the motor cortex might play, you know, have a role, might function in, you know, shaping uh, vocal output, but it's not necessary. Um, and altogether we believe, unfortunately, mice are not such a great model to elucidate the evolution of speech. So we place the mice here, um, rather saying they are more limited vocal learners at best, yeah, and certainly not moderate vocal learners. Okay, so, um, I'm not saying that it's not, you know, worthwhile to elucidate the genetic foundations of vocal learning further, but I'm saying we should turn to other models. Uh, I mean, I think another point that comes out from this is that it's, there was, for a long time, there was a conclusion that mice were definitely not interested in vocal yeah. and then everyone got excited about mm -hmm. it, and then they, the key experiments were done, and people's excitement gets down and down again. Yeah. But I think it shows you that we know very little about the learning capacities of other species. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we just discussed this over coffee. I mean, bats are now you know everybody's talking about bats and getting really excited. But I think we still lack these yeah. critical experiments. If you want to build you know a whole research career you know and a huge you know research program on it, I think we still need to do these crucial um, experiments to to go on. Yeah. But actually, I wanted to ask this: uh, Has somebody done this experiment of? Like using mutants with no or little cortex on other species than, than the mouse. I guess there are ethical issues, but if there are other vocal learners, then uh, because we no. might be surprised. I mean, maybe the majority of cows would still be okay and only more complex songs, like if you think of songbirds, because that's the other issue. There, you know, there are cows that are in, in another 
some against the place that they're... But wait, I mean, that's a very drastic intervention, right? But yeah, I mean, yeah. these other interventions, I mean, with some words, we know, at least with the obligate <coughs> learners, that if you don't provide them with auditory input, yeah. the song is... You know, it doesn't ever reach uh, the, or quite, uh, get the crystallized species specific version. Yeah? And if we change the whole perspective and say we don't need the cortex for vocal learning, is that like an hypothesis theory? <laughs> I mean, why do we say we need the cortex? Because we have this connections that we know from the birds, HVC is important for vocal learning, and this is palatal, mm -hmm. but maybe we don't need it. Yeah, I, I would, like, if you look at mouse behavior tests, often it's really hard to detect things that are cortical, I feel. I feel. Most of the behavior tests, for the classical tests, they go with like, subcortical structures, lots of like, mm -hmm. hippocampal motor things. Um, so I wonder if the mouse is a good model to test most things cortical, or if you're able to detect, maybe it's important, it's just this effects are so subtle, it's actually quite hard to, to detect it, which is what you're expecting to suggest. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can come back to this in the discussion or, you know, at night over wine or something. Um, I want to now go back to the monkeys and talk a little bit more about the listener's uh, perspective. Um, and even if you walk away with this idea, um, there is maybe more affect in the vocalizations and more innate components than maybe the, you know, some of the textbooks suggest. For the listeners, it actually doesn't matter what the source of the variation is. The only thing that matters is that there is predictable variation. And it doesn't matter whether it's affect-based or whether it's because somebody tells you there's a snake. It doesn't matter. As long as you can extract the information, okay, this kind of sound predicts the following, then I can act on it. And therefore, you know, it's adaptive to attend to these kinds of signals. And that's a general feature of communication, you know. Listeners only attend to stuff that predicts something. Either the behavior of the other animal, you know, okay, if he makes a threat face, you know, it's probably going to attack me, so I better, you know, either make a submissive gesture to begin with or I get out of the way. So much of animal communication can actually be explained exactly in these terms. You have signals that have evolved to affect the behavior of others, and you have listeners or recipients that attend to these signals because it's in their own best interest to do so. Okay, so in this sense, affect-based calls may also meet the requirements of the so-called functional referential communication because there's some certain context specificity in which they occur. Um, and, um, and they can be used to, to sort of generate specific responses that we think are highly complex, but basically all the cognitive work is done by the listeners. There's a huge problem here that we have when we try to infer call meaning uh, for the listeners. What does a call mean for the listener? And uh, Smith in, 19, in the 1970s, 70s, he said, okay, we have the following. We have um, the signal, and then the signaler, no, the recipient attributes meaning to the signal in light of the context, so basically already this sort of when we, when we talked about pragmatics, so they're basically integrating contextual information and the acoustic information to attribute meaning to the call and then they choose a response. And I think um, this is fair enough and we can sort of try to infer what goes on in the listener, but what people often do is they try to infer what goes on in the signaler. That's not valid. But you can try to think about what goes on in the listener. And I suggested to develop this a little bit further and say, okay, uh, the context may not only attribute meaning, the, uh, uh, affect the attribution of meaning, but it may also affect uh, decision making. So basically there are two steps going on to generate a response. One is you process the acoustic information, maybe you categorize it, you assign it to a certain you know, call type. Um, you may also uh, consider who has been calling. They're very sensitive to caller identity, non-human primates. And then you can make an inference what, you know, what's going on. And then in the second step, you may decide how I'm, on, I'm going to behave now. And there are, for instance, situations where you hear you're a male, you hear a female screaming, and you know who it is. Hannah is screaming. 
So Hannah doesn't happen to be your friend, so you don't do anything. But if you are Hannah's friend and you hear her screaming, you run because it has a different meaning to you, yeah? because you want to support her and she is the mother of your child or whatever. So that makes it difficult to infer from the responses what the calls mean because, you know, animals may respond very differently uh, in terms of what the cost-benefit uh, calculation is for them, you know, whether it matters to them, although they may, I don't know if, if you know, that male knows that it's Hannah screaming and that means that she's been attacked and so on and so forth, but I su suspect they do, but whether they act on it depend, may depend on another, uh, another set of parameters. And our challenge is now to try to sort of map, you know, this variation of who's calling, under which circumstances, what is the social relationship. These can all affect the behavior and try then to make inferences how they actually process this acoustic information and then maybe have a more, a richer understanding of what calls mean. Yeah? Okay, and here is one approach, again from Tabby, um, who did also the other studies on the vervets. So this is an experimental study done in Senegal with the West African green monkeys. And um, this is the snake I talked about already that was in a hut and scaring me. And sometimes uh, Tabby used it to evoke these uh, responses in the monkeys. And then this is a stuffed leopard here um, uh, from eBay. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, dismembered and the skin taken to, to Senegal and then filled with straw again. Um, and so she used these, these predator models, and then there is this paper mache eagle here. And these kinds of eagles have also been used in West Africa with other monkeys like Diana monkeys and Campbell's monkeys, and they regularly evoke um, alarm calls, except in the, ver in the green monkeys. The green monkeys were utterly unimpressed with this eagle, and they never called in response to that eagle. And we didn't know whether it was due to, you know, the fact that it was not a convincing model, but we now suspect that it's they actually don't respond to natural eagles either. So although there are martial eagles there, apparently they're not preyed upon, and so you never hear any eagle alarms. But we now bought a drone, and we're going to fly the drone <laughs> over um, the, um, uh, the green monkeys, and we'll see what kind of, you know, alarm call will they make if there's something completely different now. Is it rather, you know, these kinds or these kinds or what's going on? Anyway, so she used these models to uh, elicit calling from 11 males and 11 females in each of the two contexts. And now the question was, how does pr prior contextual information affect the responses to these kinds of calls? And for this, she used the prime probe design. So basically, she provided contextual information prior to a playback of a specific sound. So you either have a neutral context, so no additional information, or she did show the predator model again, either the leopard model or the snake model. And this is one of the scariest moments in my entire research career when I was hunched, you know, sitting under leaves, hidden away. And then I had this little um, radio, two-way radio, and she told me, okay, now the, the monkeys are here, push out the leopard, and then retrieve it again. So I pushed out the leopard, and then I retrieved it again, and then all the animals started calling, alarm calling, and then a male baboon came running. So he had attended to the vervet or the green monkey alarm calls too. He came running and was checking out the situation. If they find a leopard, they kill it. And I was sitting there with that <laughs> toy leopard, <laughs> <laughs> terrified that the baboon would detect me with a leopard in my arm and probably attack me as well. But he didn't find me, thank God. But I was really sweating blood and tears. Anyway, so here, okay, that's the presentation of the leopard model or a snake model. And then either when the animals had come down from the trees again or, you know, the alarm uh, response had uh, ceased, they would be presented either with a leopard call or a snake call. And now the question was, what's more important? Is it the acoustic information or the contextual information? And how do they you know, interact or add up? And here's a uh, video. That was in response to a snake alarm, actually.
So you do sometimes get really strong responses. I mean, clearly that animal was, you know, running away and then uh, nothing happened and then he resumed feeding. And uh, now the question was, how did the responses map onto the calls? And one interesting piece of information, I don't have a slide for this, is standing bipedally is not at all informative. Both in response to leopard alarms and snake alarms, they stand bipedally in scan the environment. So just trying to obtain more information you know, is adaptive in any case. But there were two responses uh, that were informative. One is the question, do they jump into a tree or not? And here we find a consistent effect that uh, leopard alarms were more likely to elicit this jumping into a tree responses than snake alarms. But the priming didn't have an effect. Now the problem is we have a very low power here. So I don't know if we had tested you know, 100 animals whether we actually would have found you know, some effect here or whether that's just random. I don't know. We, you know, we will never know uh, with these animals. And we, we, you know, we don't have 100 animals. We only had two groups with you know, 10 animals each. And then the other interesting response was, how long do they stay in the tree? And I keep forgetting to order, this should be 100, of course, here, uh, not a 10. Um, percent occurrence of how many animals stayed in the tree for more than two minutes. And here you see a clear effect that if they had been primed with a leopard, and then they get to hear a leopard alarm, they do stay in the tree longer. So tentatively, you know, based on this very small sample size, this suggests that there are sort of two steps, that the acoustic information is more important to choose the immediate response. And then you start to sort of think about what other information is available to you, and then you make a longer response. And then sort of once they were in a tree, they were like, oh, you know, <laughs> maybe, you know, they factor in this contextual information and they said it's better, you know, safer bet to stay up here for a while. So here we find this, but we, found, we did not find an interaction between context and call type. Okay. Um, so that brings me back to the question of is functional referential communication in any way special? And as I said, I don't think so. I think we can just omit the functionally referential and just call it communication. Yeah? Because all signals evolve to stand for something, otherwise they wouldn't have been selected for. And there is also selective pressure on listeners either to acquire this, to learn, or to have evolved the ability to respond to signals appropriately. So use signals as sources of information of what's happening next in terms of the social behavior or what's going on in the environment. And so Brandon, um, postdoc with me, we um, put out this discussion papers where we said, okay, this was a very useful paradigm. It got very many people interested in this topic, but it's now time to sort of kiss it goodbye and say, move on, you know, let's do something more interesting. And then a number of people were very upset about it and they wrote papers in defense of uh, functional referential communication. I think that's just healthy um, and we responded again. Uh, it's, it's very healthy to have this debate, and in the end, I don't know, you know how it will end up, um, but I think it's good to also go back and look at the core concepts you know, in your research field and have these kinds of more theoretical debates. Okay, um, I would say what we find, and what is really striking in, in non-human primates is that we have this dichotomy. On the one hand, we have this a uh, set of largely fixed, innate signals. The structure is fixed, there's some flexibility in usage, but the structure is, you know, limited, limited um, uh, elements and uh, mostly can be well explained by sort of an emotional account. On the other hand, we have these smart listeners. You know, we have listeners or recipients that are able to factor in information from other sources, to take in information about identity and so on and so forth. But there is no match. I mean, they switch roles. You, know, you can be a signaler and a recipient at the same time, but they don't seem to be able to integrate both sides you know, in terms of their representation. So it seems to be a rather sort of two separate chambers. And the case in point, how striking this dichotomy can be is, is the study on Rico, you know, the dog. So I heard about, okay, at that point when I heard about the dog, um, 
you know, the vervets were, were the stars with three alarm calls, you know. And then I heard about that dog who had 200, oh, in, in the, he was on TV. At that time, they, they said he had 70 toys. So he had 70 different toys, and each toy had a name. And you could ask him, you know, bring me the so-and-so, bring me the hamburger, bring me the cheese thing, bring me the apple. And he would go trot off and, you know, retrieve the correct toy. And, and of course, we didn't know whether that was a clever Hans effect. So we contacted these people and said, can we please study your dog? And they would say, yeah, great, please come. Um, and uh, the day we um, met them was actually uh, September 11th uh, in 2001. So basically, we were all watching you know, the towers come down together. So I will never forget that day anyway. But there was the dog, and at that time he already had 200 toys, and the limiting factor was the size of the apartment, because the owner said, I don't want to add more toys. I mean, we could, but I don't want to, you know, because there are toys everywhere. And um, so the experiment we did was that we placed the toys in a room with a video camera, and then he was asked from another room by the owners to fetch, you know, a given set of toys, and we selected which toys randomly and so on. So from there were maybe 10 toys, and then he was asked to, to fetch one or two of them. And he was correct in 37 out of 40 trials. So we were pretty sure he does know, you know the names of the toys. He had actually acquired that link between the sound and the toy, doing this fetching game. Um, and then we wondered, OK, how does he acquire you know, this knowledge? How does he establish the link? And it's, um, I mean, pretty obvious when you give him a new toy, you say the name a few times, he gets to play with it, and then you come back two weeks later, you ask for that toy, he knows the name. He has this relatively rapid uh, formation of the link, but maybe you can take it a step further and have him indirectly infer what you're referring to. And that's something that has been found in children, fast mapping. So you can have a child in the kindergarten, and you ask it to fetch the chromium tray. And the child, it's over there. And then the child walks over, and there's a red tray and a chromium tray. And they made that word up, right? But it sort of was greenish color. But they assumed that the, animal, uh, the child hadn't heard chromium before. And the child would bring the green tray. And then later on, you can ask the child, you know, what's the name of this color? And they would say chromium. And you can have, like, point to the chromium ball. They would point to the green one, and so on. And that was believed to be um, a necess necessity for the rapid explosion of um, word knowledge in children, to have this ability to make this indirect inferences about what you're referring to. And we were wondering whether we can you know, find a similar thing here in the dog. So I'm going to show you a video, and there are three key characters here. Uh, there is the rabbit, Kaninchen, the Hecht, this is fish here, and then there's the Lessing, that was the new new toy. Okay, and here's Rico. So again, the owner is outside of the room. Nobody's in the room except the video camera. Um, and here's what he does. Wo ist das Kaninchen? he catches the kaninchen. But he, first he went for the new thing. You know? But then he heard kaninchen again. And, like, oh. and now he's asked to bring the, the fish, the hecht, here. Yeah. And now he hears, where's the lessing, the new thing. So you th see two things. One is he wished he had hands. <laughs> the other is he has a knack for new things. Yeah? He has a certain preference or a curiosity in new things. But he's also has, I mean, we did these experiments over and over again. Um, he is not turning to any of the others. You know, he's either turning to one of the requested for or the new thing. Sometimes he just can't sort of help himself, yeah? And the other toys are known by the dog? Yeah. Okay, cool. What would happen if you put a new toy? 
Another new toy. A new toy and you ask again for the lesson. If you go to the new person, <coughs> so maybe it's a category like a new thing, something unknown is lesson. Um we didn't do that, but that's a good point. Um, all I think we're showing here is this exclusion learning. So he already knows, and you can do that with you know, seals um, and pigeons and so on and so forth. Um, simply ruling out that these animals have, or these items have lower associative strength because they're already paired with another label. And then you go for that one that isn't paired yet. It's a very simple mechanism. Um, that's not special. What's special is if you pair it with good memory, because then what we did is after he played with the lesson, we didn't repeat the name in front of, you know, while he was playing with it, we stashed the lesson away. And then four weeks later, we went back and asked for the lesson. So we, again, we had a room and then we had toys there and we asked for the lesson and then he would retrieve the lesson. Yeah? But did you or anyone else ever did category, uh, category learning with yeah. Is Alex the parrot that he knows this is green and this is uh, the shape or the material? Um, we didn't do it systematically. I mean, it was always this invasion in the family, yeah? so we were kind of limited what we were doing. But he did know ball. So ball was a category, and, but every individual ball had a specific name. Yeah? But you could ask him for the ball, and then he would bring the ball. But, or you could also say, I want the Schalke. So the balls all had soccer club names. And then they, um, he would bring the Schalke ball. So he had larger categories. And you could do other things. You could say he knew persons. So you could say bring the crocodile to Johanna. And then he would bring you know, the crocodile there. Or you could tell him to bring the crocodile into the kitchen. So there were also different locations. He would do that. So there was very stereotyped you know, commands. He would understand more complex commands than just the sound link. It would be interesting to add a new toy that just looks similar to another toy, he would uh, refer to that one, like a new ball. It looks similar to the old ball. Yeah, yeah he, he, he would generalize and he does it in the auditory domain. So the errors he makes, I, for instance, there was one toy was called Oscar and the other was called Yoshka. And these were confounded. So he made predictable errors in a way, yeah? Um, and not just random. Yeah, I mean, it would have been great to do more studies with him, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, Rico at some point, he was really old, and then there is this other group in the US, and they did, they, they also, they acquired a border collie specifically to replicate the study, Chaser, and they got Chaser to learn 1,300 toys. So they had a whole army of student assistants that would help them to train, and each of these things had a label, and, and I mean, what's interesting is that they do generalize, for instance, across speakers also. So you can have a kid ask for the Yoshka, or you can have a grown-up man or a woman, and th that's all taken care of. Yeah, he doesn't care about that. Um, and Chaser could do unlimited, almost, learning, but uh, he didn't pass the uh, fast mapping test. So we don't know, you know, whether that was exceptional and, you know, who, I mean, who goes out there and I think we have, after we published the study, of course, I was in the media all over and we got about 200 letters from dog owners and 80 of them made kind of convincing claims that their dog also knew, you know, 20 different toys or something. So, and these were all border collies or Labrador retrievers. And what I think what's happening here, there's something, something selected for that is useful in sheep herding. So it's, and my dream study would be, you know, and I think maybe I would have done it if I hadn't been, you know, appointed a primate center, is actually to study sheepdog and whether they individually know the sheep and um, if you can actually ask them to bring certain sheep because you can train dogs, border collies, to bring three sheep, for instance, and put three sheep in a certain, in the red circle or something. So there is a complex uh, attendance to complex sounds and a lot of behavior control that allows them to do this. Yeah? So I think we're, we're tapping into something there and it would be great to look at it in, in the natural environment and how, you know, how the shepherd actually trains the dog. So if someone of you, you know, feels like changing gear, <laughs> changing tack in your career, you know, that's something I would highly recommend. Is there any, because they say if you might ask larger questions, like bring first the crocodile and then uh, whatever it is, uh, other toy. 
I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so again, that dog, although he was really smart, he was only barking. Yeah? It did not affect the vocal production at all. And I think that's a case in point how, you know, D not integrated, how separate these two sides of the communicative domain are. And maybe this integration, uh, sort of, I would be interested to know how the integration of the production and the perception is either a precondition or an outcome of, you know, speech development. <coughs> and we've seen here yesterday uh, good cases of how strongly integrated this is in us. And here we see no evidence for it. And so what happens in the brain, you know, to facilitate this integration? Okay, so uh, final few words. Um, when people talk about precursors, no matter whether they talk about, you know, referential communication or about, you know, any of the other issues, um, it's important to reconsider, you know, what you're talking about. Are you talking about a derived trait? Are you talking about shared ancestral traits? Or are you talking about convergences? And we need to be much more specific, I think, you know, collectively, what we mean when we talk about a precursor. And if you type in precursor, you know, precursor for human language or speech, into you know, Google, Google Scholar or in uh, Web of Science or whatever, you will find papers that say, okay, we found speech like vocalized lip smacking. That's a precursor for the evolution, you know, for um, uh, language production. We found vocal production learning. We found suffixation. This means there are certain animals, um, Campbell's monkeys, and they have uh, one alarm call, the crack, and then they can add another, the who, and then they have sometimes they just do crack and sometimes they do crack who. Then we have reference signaling, we have compositional communication, so you know there might be a certain patterning and so on and so forth. And then there are all these claims about, okay, this is a precursor of uh, speech. And then if you map it onto a tree, so this is a well-established uh, phylogeny, primate phylogeny based on molecular data, we find, okay, speech-like vocalized lip smacking is found in Theropithecus, that's a gelada, or suffixation is found in some Sarcopithecus, or now, uh, these are actually interesting, the orangutans, so um, they have, they can whistle, and they can actually imitate whistling a little bit. But to make a good case that it is actually a precursor, you would have to show that it, it's shared. You, know, you would have to show it in all of these animals, or you would have to show that the others all lost it, and only this one retained it. And here it's also, they all lost it, and only we retained, say, vocal production learning or suffixation or whatever. So there is no, the arguments often are not string, stringent. Yeah? So they take some feature of some distantly related animal and say, this is a precursor, and I think that's not fair. They haven't shown that it's a shared ancestral trait. It might be an analog. It might be an interesting model to study some feature, but it's certainly not a precursor in the sense that it's a shared ancestral trait. Okay. So in the end, I would say we had great decades of learning a lot about non-human primate vocalizations, but there are also some things we didn't learn. But I think I'm very, I'm, um, it's kind of sobering, I would say, you know, how little we can say about language origin or speech origin. Yeah? It's very limited. And there are still very productive, promising avenues say, studying the genetic foundations, causes and consequences of the reorganization of the brain, and many aspects that are in itself very interesting. But i am become kind of wary about making any claims about, you know, this is what happened when, and I find it um, very difficult. So I'm putting my eggs in different baskets, as I said. And I think for us who study non-human primates, specifically in the wild, um, we should rather, yeah, take an evolutionary perspective in the sense that we think about the functional aspects of vocalizations, the survival value. Um, for instance, nobody has ever 
um, looked at the function of the vervet male barks as quality signals and we have evidence from a different study that they use them to show off their quality and that high quality, high ranking males produce barks that are different from you know, low quality males. And, and these are all aspects that we have neglected over the last years because we were so obsessed with finding similarities to language. And I, to some degree, I don't think we're doing the animals a favor. You know? We're underestimating actually how their, uh, the complexity and the what they need to bring to the game to make their communication system work because we are just looking at whether or not it's in any way similar to how we communicate. And so to my folks, I don't, you know, I don't have to say this to you because hardly any of you studies animal <laughs> communication in the wild, but when I talk to my own people, I tell them, you know, um, try to acknowledge under which circumstances their communication has evolved, what is the function, you know, to what are uh, uh, the aims, if, if an animal signals, what does it try to achieve with particular signaling behavior, you know, what is it for, and what's the adaptive value. And also reconsider that signaling is an essential part of social behavior, and I don't have the data now for this, but what's really striking, for instance, in the baboons, so I've been studying different baboon taxa, and the baboons, they roam all over sub-Saharan Africa as well. There are six different taxa, and they live in strikingly different societies. So we have matrilineal societies where the females stay in the group and the males disperse. We have male bonded, male philopatric societies where the females disperse, where they have a harem system, in the other they have multi-male, multi-female, some are very despotic, others are egalitarian. Really striking social differences, but the vocalizations all sound the same. And that is really bewildering. So you have this plasticity in the outcome, in the, in the social relationships, in the societies they're building, but the means, the building blocks, the means that they use to regulate their social relationships are structurally all the same. Yeah? And I think that gives us some food for thought. Okay, um, I need to mention a few key collaborators, Kurt, with whom I've been working for you know, most of my career, Dorothy and Robert, Elodie, who did um, the study in the wild. Tabby, of course, crucial, you know, she was a brilliant student, unfortunately decided to drop out of science, I'm still mad. Um, Brandon, a postdoc, and then several other collaborators. And you for your attention, and we still have some time for discussion, which is, I think, oh no, we don't. No, we don't, okay. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs>